Welcome to the seventh session of our course on everyday life in the Roman Empire. Today I want to talk about population. And as I said, you can say a lot about this, or you can say almost nothing about it. It depends on how you treat the surviving evidence. But let's begin by looking at ourselves. We live in a statistical civilization, and here on the left is a table extracted from the census returns showing the population of England and Wales between 1801 and 2021. Although these are not perfect census records, because statistics are never entirely perfect, they are entirely trustworthy. And we have been collecting and storing and manipulating these figures at least since 1801 and for over a hundred years before then we had been guessing at these figures and storing and manipulating them. And they are absolutely essential to our civilization. You need to know how many people there are in the country and you need to know how many men and women and how many people of any particular age. You need the total figure for the population. You also need to be able to count subdivisions within that total figure because it enables a whole range of government policies and government interventions. It allows the government to know how much it will be spending on pensions in 20 years' time. It allows the government to work out what hospital provision is needed for certain areas, how much school provision. It helps prepare for natural disasters and emergencies to know in which direction the population is going. It is very difficult to imagine a civilization which does not have access to statistics of this kind. And random findings from the 1801 census, quite a novelty at the time, slightly more women than men in the population. The population lived in 1.8 million houses, an average of six per house. Two million people worked in agriculture. Two million worked in making or selling things, that is in the emerging industrial economy. More baptisms and burials, which shows a rising population. And it was the 1801 census that settled a controversy which had been drifting on throughout the 18th century. Some people said the population was declining over time, others that it was rising. The census allowed us to know for sure, for the first time, that the population was indeed increasing. I said that it's useful to be able to break down these gross figures for population. Is everyone familiar with these population pyramids? Is everybody familiar with the idea of these population pyramids? No. What you do is you take the total population and you ask questions when you're counting how old are the various members of your household. Taking the population of England and Wales for 1911, you can see that there are many people under the age of five. This continues up to about the age of 20, when the numbers begin to drop off rather sharply, until when you get to 80, there are very few people of either sex. Men are blue, women are red. What that told people in 1911 was that a pension scheme would be reasonably affordable because a very small percentage of the population was over the age of 70 and most of these people wouldn't live long enough to collect very much in the way of a pension. If you turn to the population pyramid for 2020, 109 years later, what you can see is that the main bulge in the population is between the ages of about 17 and 40, and 40, let's say, which is rather nice because these are people in 
perhaps some of their most productive years. It means that you have many more taxpayers than tax eaters, people who cost the exchequer money rather than contribute to it. On the whole, people under the age of 15 do not pay much in taxes, and equally, people over the age of 65 don't pay very much in taxes. So the main bulge in our population is in the productive age groups. You can see the, these two shelves around the early 70s, which is a footprint of the post-war marriage and birth boom. Men came back from fighting in the Second World War, got married, had many children, and 70-odd years later, you can still see that outward notch in both sexes. So these population pyramids are very useful things. They help with the fine-tuning of policy. The population pyramid for 2020 tells the government that it may need to think a great deal more about long-term care for the elderly than about primary school provision. If you look at the population pyramid for Hackney in 2021, it looks rather strange. But that's because most people who live in Hackney, or a very large number of the people who live in Hackney, are young, childless people, maybe childless couples or individuals without children. They live in Hackney in their 20s and 30s, they then seem to get married and move away from Hackney. Very few children born. What that tells the local authority is that it probably needs to think more about swimming pools and leisure centres for people in their 20s and 30s than it does about playgrounds for children. So these population pyramids are very useful, and you can put those together from the raw data collected in the census. Life expectancy at birth, well, that speaks for itself. It is useful to know that life expectancy rose during the early decades of the 19th century. Then, as the cities grew larger and less healthy, life expectancy fell back to where it had been. And then from the 1840s, it began a steady upward swing, which during the 20th century became continuous. All of these things are very interesting to know. They're also critically important for the government of a modern country. We live in a statistical civilization, and we would feel that we were flying blind unless we had this great mass of statistical information. When you turn to the ancient world and when you turn to the Roman Empire, you have a different state of affairs. The Roman state did collect population data, but the interests of the Roman state were not the same as the interests of modern states. The Roman state was not interested in things like the average number of children per marriage. It wasn't interested in knowing how many people lived alone, how many people had been married but were now widowed or divorced. It wasn't interested in women, slaves or children at all. The Roman state was interested in knowing how many taxpayers there were in the empire and how many men who were eligible for military service. And so the Roman census focused on counting male taxpayers who might be eligible for military service. It wasn't interested in knowing how many women, how many children, how many slaves there were in any particular household. Indeed, I've quoted from chapter 2 of Luke here, which is a very interesting piece of text. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city, and Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, 
because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed, with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. The reason why Joseph had to leave his normal home and take his heavily pregnant wife on rather a long journey from one region to another was that the Roman census collecting system was nothing like as efficient as ours. When my wife and I moved from Charleston to Deal in 2001, we moved our residence. And so in the 2001 census, we are listed as living in Charleston. In the 2011 census, we're listed as living in Deal. The British state is perfectly capable of matching up the Shauna Andrea Gab in Deal in 2011 with the Shauna Andrea Gab living in Charlton in 2001. The Roman state couldn't do that. If Joseph had been counted in Nazareth, he would have been a new entry. The Roman state had no way of connecting him with the Joseph who had been present in Bethlehem at the time of the previous census. And so the Roman state commanded everybody who was subject to the census to go to the last place where he had been counted. The last part of the Luke quote and there were in that same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Those people were not obliged to move their residence. Either their residence hadn't changed since the last census, or they were slaves, and therefore not subject to being counted. So the Roman census was, by our standards, rather a crude thing. It was a crude thing in its collection of the raw data from which we collect our population statistics. And then there are further problems. One of the most obvious problems is that few records have survived, and those records which have survived are incomplete or damaged, which makes it very difficult to say anything for sure about ancient populations. They're often contained in literary histories, and people like Livy were notoriously careless with their reporting of numbers. Most of our surviving figures are from the city of Rome or from other large population centres. We have almost nothing from which to collect any kind of statistical information about the province of Britain, for example. Then there were often rather long intervals between census collections because of political instability or administrative changes. And then, of course, the criteria changed over time, and we don't know what the criteria were or how they changed. We can just be reasonably sure that the criteria applied by the census collectors did change over time. And so a figure from 235 AD may not be directly comparable with a figure from 35 AD, but we don't know in what ways they are not to be compared with each other. Here is a slide in which I give the raw data from which we collect our population statistics for the empire. So Pliny... There is no doubt that Rome is the largest city in the world, with more than a million inhabitants. Well, he had no doubt. Livy, in the census held by the census Gellius and Lentulus, 70 BC, the number of Roman citizens was found to be 450,000. That's 450,000 tax-paying men. It says nothing about wives or children or other members of those households. Suetonius, a biographer, not an historian. Augustus found Rome built of brick and left it clothed in marble, and its population increased to about 1.2 million. Then you have Strabo, generally a sound writer. He wrote his Geographica in about 10 AD. As for Rome, the magnitude of the city is such that in the time of census taken under Augustus Caesar, the number of citizens amounted to 4 million. Is that a corruption in the transmission of the text, or has Strabo confused the total number of Roman citizens with inhabitants of the city of Rome? We can dismiss out of hand 
the claim that there were four million people living in the city of Rome, but we do have an assurance that this was the case. Herodotus, Egypt has 20,000 inhabited cities and the land is so fruitful, etc., etc. Very useful to know, but Herodotus doesn't define city and he doesn't give the populations of those cities not a particularly useful piece of information. Strabo again, Alexandria alone is said to have over 300,000 free inhabitants, not including slaves and foreigners. Well, that looks a likely statistic, but mm, I don't know what to say about it. The ancients were not enumerate. The ancients were not incapable of collecting statistics. They just didn't have our particular interest in collecting them. When the ancients were interested in doing something, they did it very well. Look, there's a photograph I took in Athens last October of the Antikythera mechanism. It is a mechanical computer used for showing the position of the planets at any time in the future. They were able to do all sorts of very clever technological stuff, and there's a great deal of hard mathematics behind that. And then you've got that little illustration on the far right of the slide, Euclid's construction of a dodecahedron. The ancients were not at all ignorant of mathematics, and if they had been interested, they could probably have developed some kind of statistical methodology. But they didn't have the interest that our own civilization has had since maybe 1600, maybe even 1500. They just weren't interested in counting and measuring in the ways that we are. Indeed, you can see that in the way they looked at their sporting festivals. In the modern Olympics, we are told very solemnly, as if we were all interested, that somebody has shaved three hundredths of a second off the previous world record set six months ago, as if that matters. And for some people it does matter. The ancients didn't have very good time measurement technology, but they also weren't terribly interested. If you won the foot race in this year's Olympics, you were just as good as the person who won the foot race four years ago, and just as good as the person who will win it in four years' time. They didn't collect any statistics to show how long somebody took to win the foot race. It was something that didn't occur to them, and if it did occur to them, they weren't interested in following it up. With these reservations in mind, let's turn to the statistics that we are able to find. I start with the number of Roman citizens. I've mostly collected these from Livy. A great deal of work with my computer for this. You can see here is a tabulated set of alleged statistics for the number of Roman citizens. The number of Roman citizens in 508 down to about 386. You can take as entirely fabricated. It's very unlikely that those statistics were collected or that they still existed when Livy came to writing his history. We don't know what sources Livy used for reporting them, but that is what he claims about the number of citizens, and it seems reasonable to suppose that the number was increasing over time. For the later periods, these probably do record something that is true. If you look at that dip between 220 and 210, that was when Hannibal had invaded Italy, and there was a tremendous die-off in Italy, and the number of Roman citizens would have been reduced. Whether it was reduced from that number to that number, we can't say, but these statistics do seem to fit in with what we think to be reasonable. So these are not just the best statistics we have on the number of Roman citizens, these are the only statistics we have on the number of Roman citizens, and they are not entirely to be trusted. 
It's just that the direction of change between these various years does seem to fit in with what we believe to be reasonable. Probably the statistics are based on some kind of counting, how exact the counting was and what was being counted. All those are different questions. So these are the best statistics we have of the number of Roman citizens. And remember, the Romans were often very generous with their granting of Roman citizenship. After about 200 BC, an increasing number of these Roman citizens would not have lived in the city of Rome. They would not even have lived in Italy. They would have been scattered throughout the larger empire. And so the figure for 28 BC probably includes the entire free population of Italy, which by now had Roman citizenship, plus a very large number of people outside Italy in Gaul, for example, or Spain, or in certain privileged areas of the East, which had been granted Roman citizenship on a large scale. So those are the statistics we have for the number of Roman citizens. Again, I would not place any great faith on those. And certainly, these statistics in themselves do not allow us to go for any of the fine-tuning that you see when we turn our census returns into population pyramids. But these are the best we have. As for the population of the empire, that is another very difficult subject to discuss. What I did with this map on the left is I used a program called Python. I won't go into the details of what I did, but I took the best averages I could find for populations of any one region and had it put into those red circles. And this probably reports something in the direction of the truth. How do we know the population of any region of the empire? Sometimes we are given an assurance of the population of a region at any one time. Therefore, writing around 100 AD, Plutarch, the great biographer, says in passing that the population of Egypt in his day was 7 million. How he got that figure, I don't know. It's just an assurance, but I can suppose that he got it from someone who got it from someone else, and that it came down somewhere from someone who might know something of the truth. But I haven't just taken Plutarch's assurance for Egypt. I've looked at various other estimates in ancient and modern times. So we can begin when we want to look at the population of a province or of a region by looking at assurances given by ancient writers. And there are not many of these, and there are no assurances of any kind for the population of Roman Britain, which I've put as between one and two million people. Other estimates I've seen put the population of Roman Britain at half a million which is possible, but since the population of Roman London may have grown to about 250,000, half a million for the total population seems rather low. But that's all I can say, it seems rather low. There are various ways in which we can try to estimate populations. One is to look at the cultivated areas at any particular time, to work out the likely yield from that agriculture using the technology available to people at the time and making assumptions about the climate at that particular time. And then to work out how many people could survive on this agricultural output at something like a subsistence level. And again, the definition of subsistence level can fill books and books. Using these rough estimates, this is roughly the population we get for the empire and for the individual regions of the empire. When Gibbon was writing 250 years ago, 
He took it for granted that the population of the Roman Empire was about 130 million. The modern estimates are a great deal lower than that. The average is about 60 million. We think that the agriculture within the cultivated areas of the empire was sufficient to keep about 60 million people just alive, hovering on the edge of starvation, which sounds reasonable. Some areas would have rather plentiful food, others would be on the margin, but if you take the number of people who can be supported at a subsistence level by the likely agricultural output of these regions at the time, you do reach a population of about 60 million. The European part of the empire, 23, 25 million. The Asian part, about 20 million. And the North African part, 11, 12, 13 million, something like that. These are not hard figures. If you want to know what the population of York was in 1932, you can find that out with more than reasonable assurance. If you want to know what the population of Rome was in 56 AD, you really lick your thumb, hold it up to the wind, and say what's in your mind. It's not quite as bad as that, but it is difficult to get at any kind of hard figure for population. Oh, and by the way, if anybody has any questions or any comments to make on this, please do feel free to break in. A question about immigration into the cities from the countryside. Until the 1860s, cities in Western Europe were regarded as net consumers of humanity. Their death rate was always higher than their birth rate. And so cities like London swole very large because of immigration from the country districts, immigration from elsewhere in the United Kingdom. We can be reasonably sure that Rome, Alexandria, Antioch, Carthage and the other large population centres in the empire were of the same kind. It is very likely that these cities at all times had much higher death rates than birth rates and that they were continually recruited by immigration from the country districts. But we don't have any figures for that. What we do is we extrapolate to ancient times from what we know about cities in Western Europe in the 19th century. Coming to the cities, these are the best estimates I can find for the size of these ancient cities. And notice that there's quite a large spread in all of those numbers. I've given Rome in red as between 800,000 and a million. That seems likely, but I'll come to the population of Rome shortly. Alexandria, a population of between 300,000 and half a million. Some estimates put the population as high as 750,000, but I've given the population as far as we can know it for 100 AD, Population figures are always a work in progress, and so the population of Alexandria would not have been the same in 200 AD as it was in 200 BC. It would have been larger, it would have been smaller. It's unlikely to have been exactly the same. But these are the big cities of the empire. Rome, Alexandria, Antioch, Carthage. The figure for Jerusalem is particularly difficult. For the most part, the population of Jerusalem may have been hovering around 20 or 30,000, but because Jews were supposed to go there for the Passover, at least until 70 AD, the population may have swollen from 20 or 30,000 to somewhat over 100,000. So it depends on what you mean by the population of these cities. But if you look at the generality of these cities, once you get below the big ones, Rome, Alexandria, Antioch, Carthage, you can see that many of these cities are about 30,000 people, which sounds reasonable. Naples had a population of somewhat over 30,000. 
don't think I've given Pompeii on that list. We are reasonably sure that the population of Pompeii was about 20,000 people, though I did see in an article some years ago that the population is also estimated at about 10,000 people. But again, the population of Pompeii would have changed through the year. In the winter months, it would have been the natives of Pompeii living there. Then in the summer months, the population would have grown because of the numbers of people moving out of Rome to take up residence in their summer houses in Pompeii or to rent accommodation in Pompeii. So the population depends on what you mean by the population. But most cities you can see from this table would be considered rather small by modern standards. Indeed, even the population of Rome, which may have been a million, indeed probably was a million, is not exactly giant by the standards of today. I think the population of Shanghai is about 25 million, and the population of London inside the M25 area is again about 25 million. Populations of places like Moscow, New York, those are also very large by all pre-modern standards. But most cities in the empire were rather small. Some of them would have been 10,000 people, some of them as few as 5,000 people. That figure for Athens at 100,000 to 150,000, that looks like some kind of anomaly in my gathering of data, because my understanding is that the population of Athens at its peak in the 5th century, when it was the head of a large and wealthy empire, was probably only about 30,000, and it's unlikely to have grown to 100,000 in the imperial era, but that is the figure that the computer spat out after I typed in all the necessary commands and except to doubt it I'm not able to overturn it. So those are what we can say about average population estimates for those main cities in the empire. I've given you a bibliography on the right. You can go through that yourselves and work out what those writers have to say about the populations of any one of those cities. And working out population sizes, even of a distinct area like Athens, is very difficult. It requires all manner of investigations, archaeological investigations, and then all manner of assumptions piled on rather dubious information obtained from those archaeological investigations. A student notes that those small by modern standards, these estimated figures for ancient populations, are very much larger than the estimated figures for the Middle Ages. The question is, was there some catastrophic drop in population at some point around the end of antiquity? The climate began to turn colder after about 150 AD. Global temperatures dropped considerably in the 6th century. And in the middle of the 6th century, the world as a whole, and certainly the Mediterranean world in particular, was hit by a bubonic plague pandemic, which may have killed about a third of the population. We get that figure of a third by extrapolating back from the Black Death, and we know the figure for the Black Death by extrapolating from England, where we have something approaching hard statistics of the death rate. So we don't know exactly how many people were killed off by the bubonic plague, by the plague of Justinian, but it may have been about a third. What we can say about plague, what we can say about bubonic plague, is that it's not a single catastrophic event. The bubonic plague tends to come back every 20 or so years. So it strikes a virgin population, kills about a third or 40% of those people who have no resistance, 
The survivors are lucky, or they have some resistance. The plague then comes back after 20 years and draws its scythe through the replacement population, which will contain many people without resistance. So the plague of Justinian hit in about 542. It hit Constantinople in 542, and then it spread through the rest of the Mediterranean over the next few years. It may have wiped out a third, 40% of the population, and then it kept coming back generation after generation until the middle of the 8th century when it disappeared from Europe until the time of the Black Death. And from about 750 onwards, populations did begin to recover, but this was in a different kind of civilization where cities were regarded as less important. And so cities tended to be very small until until about 1300, when they began to grow large again. But I believe the population of London didn't recover its late Roman level until the last years of Elizabeth I. So there was a catastrophic drop in city populations at the end of antiquity, and that lasted for about a thousand years. The recovery in Italy was somewhat earlier, but in the rest of Europe, about a thousand years of small populations for cities. Let's come to a subject on which we really can say very little. And when I say very little, I mean almost nothing, but here are the figures. The income. How wealthy were people in the Roman Empire? We have a useful modern statistic, which is GDP per capita. That is the total amount of wealth, shall we say, produced in a country during a one-year period by factors of production controlled by residents in that country, divided by the number of people living in the country. I've given some hard statistics on the right. There is the GDP per capita for Britain, for China, and for Kenya since the year 2000. What we can see from that is that Britain has not been doing particularly well. The GDP per capita has increased from £28,000 to £40,500, whereas in China it's exploded from £1,300 to £13,000. It's also done rather well in Kenya. You can use these figures to see how well a country is doing. You can use them to judge the wisdom and the success of various government policies. It may say something about the structure of the population. It can tell you all sorts of things. It doesn't mean that everybody in Britain has an annual income of £28,000. That is the average but in a country like Britain, which has a great deal of equality, although we're told continually that it's the most unequal country, most people seem to earn somewhere between twenty and £100,000 a year, which is not a very big spread. I'd rather be closer to the 100 than the 20, I must confess, but it's not a huge difference. It's not immense swings of people with an income of £500 and some with an income of £5 million. You don't have that degree of inequality. So the 28000 means something. It also means something in Kenya because there is not a very large middle or upper class. And so that figure of £1,500 for 2023 probably tells you something real about the average in Kenya. China... I'm not too sure because China is a vast country. You've got these very rich areas on the coast. And then you have this vast, underpopulated, very poor inland area. The figure of 13.5 thousand for China may not mean much. But if we could get population statistics and income statistics for the Roman Empire probably they would tell us something real because most people were 
poor, most people were actually equal. You had a very small number of rich people. If you could know that the average income in Gaul was £900 a year, that would tell you something about living conditions in Gaul at this time. A great deal of work has been done on trying to estimate GDP per capita in the empire as a whole and in individual regions of the empire. I'm not able to explain exactly how these estimates were made, but there again is a bibliography which shows that people have been working on this. I've given the figures in British pounds for 2020, and because our experience of a 100 years of paper money has not been very inspiring, you can be sure that if you look at this table in five years' time, that figure of 1,000 to 1,500 for Italy will need to be revised. So I've given the equivalent in gold money from 1914. So you can say that the GDP per capita in Britain in about 100 AD was somewhere between £6.19 and sixpence and £8.13 shillings, whatever that means. And whatever does it mean? Bear in mind that we buy things that were not known to people in 100 AD. They also bought things that we wouldn't dream of buying, things like lamp oil. But this does tell you something in a rather impressionistic way about living standards within the empire as a whole. What it tells you is that by comparison with first world countries like Britain, America, Germany, Japan, the empire was a very poor, underdeveloped economy. But if you compare it with African countries like Kenya, which I chose at random, it was not doing that badly, and these estimated GDP per capita figures probably compare rather well with most regions of Europe until about the beginning of the 19th century. So I said that most people in the empire were living on the edge of starvation. Most people were living at subsistence level. An average income of £800 is desperately poor by our standards, but it's not exactly subsistence. You can stay alive on that. I won't say more than that because I don't know what these figures mean. I can't tell you what they represent. But you can say that compared with a modern country like Britain, the empire was a desperately poor place compared with an average African country, and it probably an upper level African country like Kenya. It wasn't doing that badly. But again, living standards, oh, there are so many things that need to be taken into account. In Kenya, for example, you don't need to buy overcoats. You don't have heating bills to worry about. Whereas in a place like Britannia, 2,000 years ago, you did need to worry about keeping warm in the winter. So comparing the 800 to 1,000 pounds GDP per capita with Kenya's 1,500 pounds probably doesn't mean that much, even if we could be sure of the British statistics from 2,000 years ago. But for what it's worth, there are the average income statistics for the empire, they probably do tell you something, but I wouldn't press them too hard, I can tell you that. A question about the possibility of investing such surpluses as were available in the Roman Empire. Jeff Bezos, the last time I checked, was worth $120 billion, but Jeff Bezos has become enormously rich by making my life richer. I sell quite a few books through Amazon, and that brings me an income stream I wouldn't otherwise have had. He also makes sure that if my wife orders great big gallon tubs of washing up liquid, they arrive tomorrow morning. Whereas in the ancient world, income was very much a zero-sum game. 
if one person had a large income, somebody else necessarily would have a smaller income. These figures do indicate that there was not much in the way of a surplus for reinvestment. You might say that the Roman Empire was trapped in a cycle of economic underdevelopment. There was no surplus for investment to increase the amount of production. But of course, economic growth depends on much, much more than GDP per capita. If you took GDP per capita as the sole determinant of economic growth, you'd have trouble explaining why countries like South Korea have pulled themselves out of poverty in the past 70 years. But the economic data that we can find for the ancient world is not immensely inspiring. Life expectancy. There is quite a lot we can say about that. I've given a table on the right. What I did was to take a random list of names as they came into my mind. I wanted the names of people who were known to have died natural deaths. Aeschylus didn't die a perfectly natural death. He's said to have been killed by a tortoise dropped on his head by an eagle. But I left that aside and put him into the table. Looking at this very impressionistic list, you do see the possibility that life expectancy in the Mediterranean world began to fall around 350 BC. So in the earlier period, you see people making it into their 60s, 70s, or in some cases into their 90s. Whereas as you come into the imperial period, people die in their 50s or 40s for the most part. And these are people in the higher classes. Pliny the Younger died at the age of about 52. Apuleius had a rather checkered life, died at 46. And Ovid died in his 60s. Um, how old was Virgil? 51. It does look as though life expectancy dropped, but real estimates of life expectancy are obtained in rather more rigorous ways than the method that I adopted in that right-hand table. There again on the left you have a bibliography so you can investigate it for yourselves. What we do for life expectancy is we take the statistics we have for China and India around the beginning of the 20th century, before those countries had been introduced to modern sanitation and before the development of antibiotic drugs, and you extrapolate from those to the Roman Empire. It strikes me as a valid approach. Otherwise, you look at inscriptions, inscriptions on gravestones, which often say how old somebody was at death, but that's rather a difficult approach to take because gravestones were only put up by those people who could afford them. It doesn't tell us about life expectancy of agricultural workers. Valentina Gazzaniga, a medical historian in Italy, She's done a lot of research on about 2,000 Roman skeletons, all working-class people buried in common graves. Average age of death was 30. A high number of the skeletons were around that age, and many showed the effects of trauma from hard labour, as well as diseases that we would associate with later ages like arthritis. I'd take that as hard evidence. But there at the top is an overall estimate of life expectancy at birth and then life expectancy at 20. The reason for the difference should be obvious. When you have a high rate of child mortality, when two out of five children die before the age of five or seven, the average life expectancy at birth will be rather low. It's more reasonable to count people when they get to the age of 20 and then work out how much longer they can be expected to live. So for senators, life expectancy at the age of 20 was early 50s, early to mid 50s. These are the richest people in the empire. Those are the people with the best food, the best living conditions. 
and the best access to such medical services as were available at the time. As you get down to slaves, their life expectancy appears to have been about 35 to 40 years, which would roughly align with Valentina Gatzeniga's figures. So life expectancy was nothing wonderful, but it compares pretty well with life expectancy in England in the 19th century, where again, members of the higher classes would not usually get as far as their 60s. You can go through a long list of 19th century English men and women, people like Jane Austen, Charles Dickens, T.B. Macaulay, John Stuart Mill. You can take a long list of people at random and you can see that many of these people didn't make it as far as 60. Macaulay was 59. He had been suffering from a heart condition from the age of about 52, a heart condition which nowadays would be fixed with a stent or a handful of pills, but it killed him before he was 60. And so it goes on. So 50 to 55 years for the higher classes doesn't sound so bad by any standards except our own. A question about whether we can break down these life expectancy statistics by gender. I don't believe that it's possible looking purely at what we've discovered directly from the ancient world to give any kind of gendered breakdown of life expectancy. The most we can do is extrapolate from 19th century English or more likely Indian and Chinese data into the Roman Empire. And there you would see that the life expectancy of women at the age of 20 was lower than for men. But the life expectancy of women, if they made it to 50, would be somewhat higher than for men. But we don't have information, we don't have direct information from the ancient world that lets us say this. You can assume it. It seems a reasonable assumption, but there's no way of telling. Country life, and that's where most people lived. No great fun. There's a quotation from Galen. The famine prevalent for many successive years in many provinces has clearly displayed for men of any understanding the effect of malnutrition in generating illness. The city dwellers, as it was their custom to collect and store enough grain for the whole of the next year immediately after the harvest, carried off all the wheat, barley, beans and lentils, and left to the peasants various kinds of pulse after taking quite a large proportion of these to the city. After consuming what was left in the course of the winter, the country people had to resort to unhealthy foods in the spring. They ate twigs and shoots of trees and bushes and bulbs and roots of inedible plants. Shows you a most undesirable state of affairs. The cities were parasitic on the country districts, and what couldn't be extracted by the more genteel methods of taxes and rents was taken, it seems, by force, leaving the country people on the edge of, or sometimes somewhat below, the subsistence level. There's a mosaic showing country people at work. The reason they're naked, partly they were poor, but also clothing was expensive. You don't want to get it spoiled by working in it and so you wear clothing off to the fields when you arrive at the fields you take off your clothes you do the work naked when you finished you have a wash and put your clothes back on people didn't have our own sense of modesty in the ancient world so nudity was not considered anything disgraceful indeed until the 1880s this was how peasants in japan worked the government then decided that it was rather undeveloped to see people working in the field naked and made a law saying, you know, you've got, you've got to cover up to work in the rice field, sorry. More showing country life of various kinds. We know very little about country life. We know very little about what these people thought or believed. We don't know their names. We know that they were the majority, but we know very little about them. Most of our information is from the cities. 
Let's turn to the city of Rome. There is a map of Rome at about the birth of Christ. It's a large city, a very large city. We can be sure of that. Strabo says... Rome has grown so much that it is the greatest and most splendid of all cities, unparalleled in its size, the grandeur of its public and private buildings, and the magnificence of its monuments. You can see that directly. Just go to Rome and look at the monuments. Ammianus Marcellinus, writing nearly 400 years later, Rome, the queen of cities, which sees and hears every day so many wonders, is resplendent with the greatest and most magnificent buildings. When the Roman government wanted to know the population of Rome, they had to estimate it. Here's a curious passage from the life of Elar Gabalus, one of the stranger emperors. He ordered that all the cobwebs in the city of Rome be collected together, and it is said that a considerable weight of them was brought together. Another source tells me that it was a weight of 10,000 pounds of cobwebs. And from this, the Roman government tried to estimate the population of the city. They don't seem to have been able to have counted the people. I would like to visit the ancient world as a tourist. I would get a full set of vaccinations done before I set out. I'd have any dental work done, and I'd make sure I was well provided with gold and silver coins, and I might even have some kind of fail-safe button I could press and jump back into the present. I'd like to visit the ancient world, I'd like to see the centre of Rome, I'd like to walk those streets. I don't think I'd like to have lived there. There are some estimates of the population of Rome. And you can see that in the earliest figures we have, about 150,000. That sounds reasonable. The latest figures we have before the Middle Ages, 90,000. That sounds likely as well. During the High Imperial period, probably it did reach to about a million people. All of the indicators point in that direction. A population of about a million you have the assurances of writers at the time who may have been in a position to know something of the truth, and all of the estimates that we can make since then point towards a million people. So we can take it reasonably as read that the population of Rome around 100 AD was, give or take 100,000, about a million. How did those people live? Vast amounts of food had to be imported into the city every day from farms around Rome and in central Italy. For bread, there was the Anona, a state-controlled grain supply system, which requisitioned or bought grain from Sicily, North Africa and Egypt, brought it to Rome. There was a state system of insurance that guaranteed the seaborne importation of corn all year round into Rome. The corn dole, the Anona, this was begun in the 130s BC and it continued until the 5th century, I think. Sometimes corn was distributed free, sometimes it was distributed at a heavily subsidised price. About £95 of grain every month for eligible recipients. These eligible recipients would have been the heads of households. We don't know how many people were in these households, but you can take a rough estimate of five or six. The number of recipients rose and fell over time, depending on the firmness of the emperor. The figure of £95 was not fixed. Sometimes it would be more, sometimes a bit less. But there was some system of subsidised or free distribution of corn to eligible citizens. If you moved to Rome from the provinces you would not be eligible for the corn dole immediately. You might have to wait five or ten years, or you might be able to get onto the list immediately. 
All we can say is that the Roman government took some interest in maintaining that million people in the city of Rome, not in comfort. Those Americans who talk in rather mournful tones about how Rome was destroyed by state welfare don't understand the nature of ancient economies or ancient attempts at welfare systems. £95 of unmilled corn every month for households of unknown size is not tremendously generous, but it was enough to keep the population alive. We do have some figures for the imports of corn from Egypt to Rome during this period. Around 200,000 tonnes of corn imported from Egypt to Rome. That's a very large amount of corn, and the whole Egyptian economy was directed towards supplying first Rome and then Constantinople with corn. We know a great deal more about the water supply in Rome. The Romans were notable water engineers. There on the bottom right of this slide is a listing of the main aqueducts that brought water to the city. Here are some photographs showing the aqueducts. But the Roman water system, Roman water systems all over the empire were not based purely on aqueducts. You also had these siphons which would carry water in sealed pipes down a hill through a valley and up and over the next hill. The Romans had some very sophisticated water engineering technology and we still don't entirely understand how this worked. But here are some estimates, fairly good estimates, for the Roman water supply around 100 AD. We know this by looking at the aqueducts, and it's not difficult to work out how much water they could transport. There is some vagueness in the figures because we don't know how well maintained the aqueducts were. If they're not perfectly maintained, there's a great deal of leakage of water from these channels, but the best estimates we can get to are that imperial gallons of water per day per head of population in Rome, and that is based on assumptions about the Roman population, which are probable but by no means certain. It seems about 250 gallons a day of water per head of population in Rome. Contrast this with 20 to 25 gallons of water per day per head of population in London in 1920, and between 35 and 40 gallons a day in 2020. New York came close in the early 20th century, but has fallen back since. Oh, and I've given some figures for Beijing as well. 30 to 40 gallons of water per day, comparable to London and modern New York. Rome was uniquely well provided with water, where did this water go? How was it used? We're not entirely sure. About a third of it seems to have been reserved for the public baths, for fountains, and for other things of that nature. About a third for the houses of the wealthy, and about a third for watering market gardens. There's no doubt that Rome was somewhat more fortunate in its water supply than modern London. And if you live in London, I don't think you feel any shortage. I don't think you feel any sense of deprivation when you step into the shower in the morning. So we can say that the city of Rome and many other Roman cities had a very generous water supply. This was used quite often for bathing, and I'm not going to say anything about bathing. I will let you look at those slides for yourselves. I won't say anything about the toilets either. What I will say is that the hygienic value of all this bathing and all this drainage system doesn't seem to be as great as we would like it to have been. Piers Mitchell, a modern researcher, 
has gone through remains from Roman toilets, looking at what was in people's stomachs before they emptied them, shall we say. He's found that the Romans were horribly infested with intestinal worms and lice and fleas. Although the Romans didn't smell, although the Romans looked rather sweet and clean, they were a great deal dirtier than people in the Middle Ages. They were a great deal dirtier than people in the 17th and 18th centuries, people who didn't bathe, because well, people did bathe in the Middle Ages, but in the early modern period they didn't bathe very much. It seems that the Romans were no healthier when it came to lice and intestinal parasites than people in England and France in the 17th and 18th centuries. So much work devoted to bringing water to Rome, so much work devoted to building those large and magnificent bathing complexes, and the Romans were still rotten with intestinal parasites in ways that would raise eyes in the poorest area of the third world today. Coming to the end of what I have to say, and there is much, much more that I could say, we can conclude by saying once again that although the ancient world would be a jolly place to visit, it's not a place where any reasonable person would want to live, is it? If you want to know more, I'll send these slides to you. And I've given you two slides worth of sources. So there's a large bibliography, and this will get you into the whole subject of what we can know about the demography of the Roman Empire. OK, I've gone almost up to the end, but does anybody have any questions? We'll take some questions next week, because I've gone over a very large subject, and I'm sure questions will arise. So what we've looked at is what we can say about the size of the population of the Roman Empire and of individual parts of the Roman Empire. We've looked at the size of the cities. We've looked at very fanciful estimates of income per head of population We've looked at life expectancy, and we've looked, to some degree, at general health. We can't say a lot for sure, but we can guess a lot. And some of what we guess does seem to head towards the truth, shall we say. By modern standards, an impoverished and a most unhealthy society. Any last-minute questions or comments.